are so many people in the world, and, and, and you know, you may be watching this right now, and you have these incredible ideas, and what you think is missing is motivation. And that's not true. Because the way that our minds are wired, and the fact about human beings, is that we are not designed to do things that are uncomfortable, or scary, or difficult. Our brains are designed to protect us from those things because our brains are trying to keep us alive. And in order to change, in order to build a business, in order to be the best parent, the best spouse, to do all those things that you know you want to do with your life, with your work, with your dreams, you're going to have to do things that are difficult, uncertain, or scary, which sets up this problem for all of us. You're never going to feel like it. Motivation's garbage. You, you only feel motivated to do the things that are easy, right? What do you think that is? Oh, I know exactly why that is. Because I, I, I've studied this so much because for me, one of the hardest things to figure out was why is it so hard to do the little things that would improve my life? And what I've come to realize and what we'll talk a lot about today is that the way that our minds are designed is our minds are designed to stop you at all costs from doing anything that might hurt you. Mm -hmm. And the way that, 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 that this all happens is it all starts with something super subtle that none of us ever catch. And that is with this habit that all of us have that nobody's talking about. We all have a habit of hesitating. Mm -hmm. We have an idea. You're sitting in a meeting. You have this incredible idea, and instead of just, you know, saying it, you stop and you hesitate. Now, what none of us realize is that when you hesitate, just that moment, that micro moment, that small hesitation, it sends a stress signal to your brain. It wakes your brain up, and your brain all of a sudden goes, oh, oh wait a minute, wait, wait. Why is he hesitating? He didn't hesitate when he put on his killer spiky sneakers. He didn't hesitate with the uh, really cool track pants. He didn't hesitate with the NASA t-shirt. Now he's hesitating to talk. Something must be up. So then your brain goes to work to protect you. It has a million different ways to protect you. One of them is called the spotlight effect. It's a known phenomenon where your brain magnifies risk. Why? To pull you away from something that it perceives to be a problem. And so you can truly trace every single problem or complaint in your life to silence and hesitation. Those are decisions. And what I do and what's changed my life is waking up and realizing that motivation's garbage. I'm never going to feel like doing the things that are tough or difficult or uncertain or scary or new. So I need to stop waiting until I feel like it. And number two, I am one decision away from a totally different marriage a totally different life, a totally different job, a totally different income, a totally different uh, relationship with my kids. Not like one decision I'm divorcing you in, in the marriage example, but one decision on, you know, you could be having a conversation with your spouse and you feel your emotions rise up and within a tiny window, those emotions can take over and can impact how your marriage goes. Or... You can learn how to take control of that micro moment and make a decision to act in a way that actually shifts your marriage. Your life comes down to your decisions. And if you change your decisions, you will change everything. Yeah, I mean, that, that core concept comes through so powerfully in your book. Um, which is phenomenal, and I would love it if you would take a second to tell people the story of how... And by the way, I wore the NASA shirt because of the Oh, is imagery. that why you wore yeah, it? Yeah, of course. Oh my God, I'm like falling my glasses off. That is... I did not even get that. Yes. I was going to ask you why you wore that shirt. Yes. Oh my gosh, wow. So break You it actually down. do your homework. Oh, of course, no, absolutely. Okay, so um, let me just take you back. So so what, what you're talking about is the five-second rule, which has become literally my life's work. And it was all a gigantic mistake. <laughs> I, re I read up on you too and understand how Quest like bo be was born out of misery. Mm. The five second rule and my life now and my 20 year marriage and everything that I'm doing and the companies that I've built and sold and the company I'm building now, it all comes back to a point in my life that completely and utterly blew. I was 41 years old. I was unemployed. 
Um, my husband had um, started a restaurant business, which was his dream. This is actually a funny story. When he, he got laid off from a big job in high tech, and I think he was really relieved. You know how a lot of us wait to quit our jobs, and then we get laid off, and we're like, yes. Um, and he said, I'm not going to look for a job. I'm going to go into the restaurant business. And I think I said the most famous lines of our marriage at that point. I looked at him, and I said, listen, buddy. Inspiration is for strangers. You get your butt back to that job <laughs> and you pay the mortgage. And um, again, micro moment that where I'm being amazing. a jerk instead of being a supportive wife. But that's an example of where when he said he was not going to go get a job, but he was going to start a business, mm-hmm. the first thing that was there was fear. Right. And so fear was making the decision for me. God, I love that you can share that, though. That's so powerful. Well, so what happened is he, the first restaurant was a home run. And of course, what do you do when things are successful? You grow it, Mm. you grow it really big. And so they decided to raise some money and we threw in our home equity line, the kids' college savings. Mm. They tried to open a second and a third. And at the same point, a grocery store chain encouraged them to go into wholesale. So it basically got way too big, way too fast. And the wheels started to come off. And they came off so badly that the second restaurant failed and they held on to it for too long, like a lot of us do. It's another trick our brains play on us called sunk costs. Mm -hmm. When you throw a ton of time and a ton of money at something, it's really hard to let go of it. And if you haven't done it in business, we all have a relationship in our past, stayed way too long. That was a trick your brain played on you. Um, So by the time that they closed the second restaurant, it was an $800,000 loss. Ooh. I don't, I, I mean, that meant our entire home equity line gone. Right. It meant um, kids call. I get just choked up just thinking about how terrifying it was. And so I found myself at the age of 41, like, just feeling like a complete failure. And so did Chris. And to make it worse, not only had we lost all of our savings, but so many friends and family members had invested. And so there was this real tension between the truth of what was happening and what you had to do in public because it was a public business. Shame, failure, embarrassment, and the lean started to hit the house. The phone started to ring, and it was nothing but collection calls. And I just remember feeling this tremendous shame. And at some point, I think we all hit that moment in life where things just are not going how you thought they would go. And and what's amazing about those moments is we all respond very differently. So my husband, he would spring out of bed and he would head right out that door, six o'clock in the morning, and he would go meet his partner and they would go to the bank and they would dig right in and they would face their problems head on. And I, he's also a smart guy. I mean, he did not want to be in the house when yours truly woke up because <laughs> I was a raging bitch at that point in our lives. And the reason why is because when you're scared and you're afraid and you're jealous and you're overwhelmed with emotion, it is so much easier to point the finger at other people. That's a decision, by the way. Sure. One, you may not be aware that you're making, but you're still making it. So what would happen to me is the exact opposite, is is Chris would be gone, the alarm would go off at 6 o'clock in the morning, and I would lie there. And I would think about the lien on the house, and I would think about the uh, bankruptcy that we were facing, and I would think about how much we had fought the night before, and I would think about the fact that I was unemployed, and I would hit the snooze button. And why would you get up when your life is like that? Why would you? I I mean, I needed confidence. I needed courage. I was so tapped out. And, and, you know, in the scheme of life, hitting the snooze button is not that big of a deal. But here's the thing about life. None of us wake up and say, today is the day I destroy my life. What we do is we kind of check out because it feels overwhelming. Or we check out because we're afraid. Or we check out because we start listening to self-doubt. And then we make these teeny tiny decisions all day long. We don't even realize it. Decision to not get up on time. A decision to not eat the right thing. A decision to snap at your kids. A decision to not speak in a meeting. A decision to not look for a job. A decision to not deal with your finances. A decision to not call your parents. Like, whatever it is. All day long, these tiny decisions that take you so far off track. And then you wake up like I did, and, and you, you look at your life, and you think, how the hell did I get here? And more importantly, how did I get back over there? And you have no idea. 
And so I was so trapped. And I know from your story, you felt the same way. Like you knew that there was more in store for you, but you couldn't figure out how do you close the gap? How do you find the power that's in you? How do you discover your greatness? How do you solve these problems? It feels so overwhelming when you can't, I mean, I would go to the grocery store and, and the items would scan and I would be sitting there readying my excuse because there was no way that my check card was going to clear. Wow. So, um, what ha I, I got in the struggle with myself that a lot of us find ourselves in, and that is you get trapped in what I call the knowledge action gap. You know what to do, but you can't seem to make yourself do it. Yeah. Right? I mean, every one of us is one Google search away from a list of instructions that if you follow really any of them, point. it will change your life. Mm -hmm. But how do you get out of your head and stop thinking about what you need to do and actually do it? And in my case, this stuff was pretty easy. Get up on time, make breakfast for the kids, get them on the bus, start looking for a job. Be nicer to Chris. Don't drink so much. Instead of isolating yourself, pick up the phone and call a friend. Get yourself out into the woods and go for a walk. Start running again. Like all these little things that I was capable of, but I couldn't get out of here. Could not get out of here. And if, if, if you're stuck, that's the problem. The problem is you're, you're in your head. You're thinking. That is the universal problem. And it all starts with this knowledge of what to do. And then you hesitate and you think about whether or not you feel like doing it. So for a couple of months, I was, I was really stuck. I, I would, Chris would get up at six, I'd hit the snooze, and then I'd hit the snooze, and then I'd hit the snooze, the kids would miss the bus. And then every night I'd do the same thing. I'd, I'd go in bed. Have you ever had one of those nights? Probably before you started your company, but it, where you go in bed and you're like, all right, Tom, that's it. Tomorrow, it's the new me. Tomorrow. Tomorrow, I'm going to get up on time. I am going to go to the gym. I am going to look for a job. I'm not going to drink so much. It's going to be amazing. The new me, the future me. Woo! Let's do this, right? <laughs> then you go to bed and uh, you wake up seven hours later and you're like, I don't who feel like that? the new me. Yeah. It's the only, who, that's a stupid, see, motivation's garbage. It's never there when you need it. Ever, 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 ever. And so here's what happened to me. And thank you for wearing the NASA t-shirt. It's a really stupid story. It's a powerful story. So one night, Chris had gone to bed. I had been struggling, struggling, struggling. We still had all the same problems. I, we still had a lien on the house, still facing bankruptcy, still fighting like crazy. I was still unemployed. He still, they still hadn't figured out like the solution yet for the business. And I was about to turn off the TV and there on the, the TV, there was this rocket launching and I thought, oh my gosh, that is it. I am going to launch myself out of bed like a rocket ship, like NASA right here had launched me out of that bed. And I'm going to move so fast that I don't think mm. I'm going to beat my brain. Now, here's a really interesting point. Um, I talk a lot about your instincts and inner wisdom. And we can get into this a little bit later, but a lot of us talk about the fact that you have a gut feeling. But what all this research that I've done for the book and, and all the speaking that I do, what I've discovered that's fascinating is actually when you set goals, when you have an intention on something that you want to change about your life, your brain helps you. What it does is it opens up a checklist and then your brain goes to work trying to remind you of that intention that you set. And it's really important to develop the skill. And I, I say that word purposefully, the skill of knowing how to hear that inner wisdom and that intention kicking in and leaning into it quickly. Mm. So for me, my brain saying, that's it, right there. Move as fast as a rocket, Mel. I wanted to change my life. And I think most people that are miserable or that are, that are really like dying to be great and mm. dying to have more, we want to change. We want to live a better life. We want to create more for our families. We want to be happier. The, the desire is there. Again, it's about how do you go from knowledge to action. So the first thing in this story that's important is realizing that the answer was in me. And my mind was telling me, pay attention. Could have also been the bourbon. 
<laughs> Manhattans that night. But. Anyway, the next morning, the alarm goes off, and um, I pretended NASA was there. It's the stupidest story. I literally went five, four, three, two, one. I counted out loud, and then I stood up. And I, I'll never forget standing there in my bedroom. It was dark. It was cold. It was winter in Boston. And for the first time in three months, I had beaten my habit of hitting the snooze button. I couldn't believe it. And I thought, wait a minute. Counting backwards? That is the dumbest thing I've ever heard in my entire life. Well, the next morning I used it again and it worked. The next morning I used it again and it worked. The next morning I used it again and it worked. And then I started to notice something really interesting. There were moments all day long, all day long, just like that five second moment in bed where I knew knowledge what I should do. And if I didn't move within five seconds, my brain would step in and talk me out of it. Every human being has a five-second window. It might even be shorter for you. You have about a five-second window in which you can move from idea to action before your brain kicks into full gear and sabotages any change in behavior. Because remember, your brain is wired to stop you from doing things that are uncomfortable or uncertain or scary. It's your job to learn how to move from those ideas that could change everything into acting on them in the smallest moment. And for anyone right now at home who's thinking, like, this sounds too simple, too easy, talk a bit about your community. Because reading some of their comments, <laughs> oh. it is, it's crazy how many people, like the sheer volume of people you quote in your book, but if you also go online and just look at the people that are, like, directly reaching out to you, it, it is an avalanche of people that have stories around the five-second rule. Well, one of the reasons why I'm so excited about this book, and look, you don't have to buy the book. This is an idea that you can use. It's free. It's backed by science. Mm -hmm. More than 8 million people around the world have discovered it. And, you know, you're talking about the number of people. We've heard from more than 100,000 people in 80 That's countries crazy. that are using this rule. We know of 11 people who have stopped themselves from killing themselves using this rule. I, I saw one of those. Yes, outreaches. yes. There's a guy, Steve, that wrote to us who was a veteran. He was suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder. He boarded a ferry overseas with the intention to jump over. He walked over to the railing, yeah, and his inner wisdom kicked in. In that moment, the five-second rule, five, four, three, two, one, counting backwards, moved away from the railing, asked for help, saved his life. His story has inspired countless other people that have heard me in the speeches that I give around the world about this one tool. And so, you know, the thing, the, the thing that's so cool about this, and, and I should tell you the science behind it, because I'm going to be honest with you, it is stupid. Had I ever thought that I would find myself eight years after discovering it, spending my days telling people about the five second rule. First of all, I would have picked a different name because it reminds <laughs> you of the one where you have to like pick up food within five seconds off the floor, right? Yeah, right? Yeah. Um, it was my secret weapon. This was something I did. I never intended to tell anybody because I went from getting up on time and waking up on time to shaking up my entire life. Because when you understand the power of a five second decision, and you understand that you always have a choice to go from autopilot to decision maker, everything in your life will change. You will be a different negotiator. You will be different in sales. You will be unstoppable in the gym because you will realize the amount of garbage that you put in the way of your hopes, of your dreams, of your potential, of your confidence, of your courage. Everything comes down to the decisions that you make. We all know what to do. None of us know how to make ourselves do it. So um, I started researching it. Why does something so stupid work? Why? Why does something so silly create such powerful and profound change? Well, here's why. The rule is a form of metacognition. Metacognition is a fancy pants term that means something real simple. You can outsmart your own brain in furtherance of goals. There are tricks that you can use that actually outsmart the tricks your brain plays on you in furtherance of a higher purpose. We all know this. You can, you can restrain yourself 
if uh, you're in a situation that calls for it. You can jump into a raging river to save your dog or your kid. You can direct yourself in ways if it's important to you. And so the rule, what it does, is it does something really remarkable. When you count backwards, five, four, three, two, one, what you're actually doing is you're interrupting what researchers call habit loops that get encoded as, as closed loop patterns in your basal ganglia. That's the part of the brain where your feelings, where your emotions, every habit that you have, which is nothing more than behavior that you repeat that you don't even think about. I've heard it referred to as a gearbox. Yeah. You shift your attention. From yes. And so when you go five, four, three, two, one, it interrupts what's going on here that's spinning without you thinking and it moves and awakens your prefrontal cortex. So when you hit one, your habit has been interrupted. So you've interrupted self-doubt. You've interrupted maybe snapping at your kids. You've interrupted the desire to grab for a drink. You've interrupted, uh, procrastination. You've also, by counting backwards, done an action. It's awakened your prefrontal cortex. That is the part of the brain that you need that's awake when you're changing behavior, when you're learning new things. When you hit one, it's also a prompt. So in the language of research, uh, you'll hear people talk about um, starting rituals. That is, that is something that's proven to help you learn a new habit. The five-second rule, when you repeat it, becomes a starting ritual mm. that triggers you to act with confidence, that triggers you that this is a moment for courage, that triggers you to shift gears. And because you've also done the manual work of awakening the part of the brain that you need to change, you've set yourself up for success. It doesn't work if you count up, because you can keep going. And also, counting up doesn't require focus. If you count backwards, five, four, three, two, one, it, again, awakens the prefrontal cortex and it prompts you to move. When you start to use it and then you read about it, you'll see that, that it's being used all over the place. They use it in the armed services in order to align troops and get them to start an exercise. They use it at elementary schools, five, four, three, two, one, at big assemblies to get a huge room full of kids to stop a talking. Really simple and interesting example, yeah. Because it requires you to focus. It's not a habit. It will become a habit that prompts you to have confidence and courage. But in the beginning, it interrupts patterns of behavior that you do on autopilot. It helps you assert control. And it teaches you how to become the kind of person that moves from thinking about something to actually doing it.